Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back to our ICAD sessions. My name's Jules, I'm the speaker liaison for ICAD London 2019. It's my greatest pleasure to introduce Carlos Martinez this morning. Um, Carlos is the clinical supervisor at on-site workshops. He has worked in the mental health and human services field for over 20 years, serving as a pastor, chaplain, drug and alcohol counselor, mental health screener, and program manager for a mental health intensive outpatient program. Carlos has experience in several modalities of treatment, including Gisalt, experiential psychodrama, DBT, CBT, and logotherapy. This session is a two hour workshop, experiential therapy, sorry, experiential therapy, how it accesses the right brain in therapy. The session will focus on effects of developmental trauma during the developmental of the right brain, as well as exploring techniques that access where the origins of traumas occurred. Experiential therapy can provide a pathway for clients to connect with the unconscious, allowing them to own, the st to own their story remembered by the body at an emotional level. Carlos, it's over to you. Thank you. Good morning. Are people filing in? Come on in. <clears throat> so I'm the clinical supervisor at Onsite Workshops. Any people familiar with or have been to Onsite before? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I've intimate knowledge of, in, of Onsite. Have insight into Onsite. So. Um, I am, uh, let's see, um, as a clinical supervisor, I work there supervising some of the programs that we run, and that includes the Healing Trauma Program, one of my all-time favorite programs. I love trauma. I love working with people who have survived trauma, survivor myself, and so I love that population, and I, um, I get it in a way that that is uh, sometimes misunderstood by the community at large, and so I, I definitely have a heart for that. Also supervise the Healthy Sexuality and Intimacy program um, for men and, and hopefully pilot programs soon to be uh, women struggling with uh, sexual addiction and relationship issues. And we are starting a program in July, if not September, uh, called the Grief and Loss Program, specifically targeted to people who have lost uh, siblings, loved ones, parents, children on the heels of running something uh, called the um, uh, Life After Loss Program, which is an on-site foundation. We led people through, um, the on-site foundation essentially paid for a group of parents who've lost children to come through and do an experiential week-long uh, workshop. So I, I did some uh, group leadership with that. So this morning, I wanna talk to you about uh, the right brain and how it's uh, affected and uh, influenced by our life experiences and how we can access that in in experiential therapy and so this is uh, this is the talk welcome if you're not in the right place um, welcome anyway <laughs> <laughs> they say uh, they say that so this is my first ever ICAD presentation my first time here presenting so thank you very much for the hospitable welcome they say that you never forget your first ICAD presentation. Actually, no one says that. No one's ever said that. <laughs> um, and so what I'd like to do is, uh, my boss isn't here right now to stop me from doing this. So we're going to do a group selfie. And everyone say, uh, everyone say Wensleydale. One, two, three. With <laughs> oh, I did. I did, that was an experience. Okay, so one, two, three, cheddar. <laughs> okay, so that was completely for my three-year-old, so thank you for that. So some disclaimers as I get into the talk. I'm gonna warn you in advance that I'm not a scientist, I'm not a researcher per se, I'm a clinician, and I've worked in the clinical field for almost 20 years as uh, my introduction said. And so this is not necessarily a talk where I'm gonna show you brain scans, fMRI studies of people with and without before and after experiential activities. But um, for those of you who would like it, here is a picture of an fMRI scan of brains. Uh, so if it's important to you, that would be the right hand side and that's what we're gonna talk about today. And that concludes the portion of the fMRI study you're going to see. 
what I am going to do is tell you about um, two parts. And so in part one, uh, we're going to look at the hemispheres and therapeutic action. So a lot of working practice and a lot of theory grounded in, in experiential practice. Um, the first part, I'm going to talk about the left brain and the right brain and how they interact with each other in development, how trauma affects that development. And then in part two, we're going to talk about how experiential therapy accesses the right brain in particular. So I thought it would be helpful to start out with talking about myths about the brain. So any idea, anything, this is open to the general public, um, what myths have you heard or heard rumors about in regarding brain and brain development, and anyone? That it stops developing after a certain age. Excellent. So, yes, yeah, so it, at a certain point, it's, it's plasticity. plasticity. Right, yes, excellent. Yeah, excellent. What else? Other myths? Did you Yes, yeah, very good. I'm going to talk about that a little bit in the presentation that there are memories that precede uh, the, the spoken ability to recall. So in attachment psychology, we call that the unthought known, something that your body can hold on to, but you may not be able to, to vocalize. And we heard the myth that we only use 10% of our brains. Yeah. There was a whole movie made on that called Lucy uh, with um, Scarlett. Pete, Scarlett Johansson and Morgan Freeman. And the premise was, oh, gosh, this person was given this uh, incredible, this miracle serum and slowly, incrementally started going up from 10% up to finally 100% where she ascended into the heavens and, you know, the universe has changed. <laughs> but we regularly use 100% of our brains. That's why I'm so exhausted at the end of the night because I use <laughs> 100%. God help us if we only use 10% of our brains. Um, but we use it all and we use it in different capacities. And this is another myth that I wanted to go over. Have you heard the idea that there are left brain people and right brain people? So people who say, oh gosh, I'm so left brain, I'm so analytical, or I'm so thought oriented, or I'm so you know, criti critical thinking. And then there's the artist, the right brain person, the person who's living in creativity and spontaneity. And it used to be the case that we would say, oh, that's a left brain person or a right brain person. So what the science and what the research is telling us is that this is false. That there are not right brain or left brain people per se, that there are people. And in our personhood, we access both parts. And in our creativity, we may lean towards and borrow from the right brain or lean on the left brain more or less but we access both parts and we wouldn't be whole people without that and so <clears throat> this this initial idea that um, that we're left or right brain people keeps us from understanding the brain development as a whole so what I'd like to do is in this first part of the talk and tell you about what I do in, in, uh, in our programs, um, give you an overview of one of the talks that I give. So this is a presentation of uh, the trauma talk. So I'll give this in our <coughs> healthy sexuality talk in our healing trauma program. And what I also like to do is step back and kind of in a meta sense, um, kind of breaking the fourth wall while I'm in the talk is talk about the talk and talk about the concepts in the presentation. So I start with this idea that um, people will ask these questions in therapy and it is one of the most basic, it's one of the most confounding questions and that is that people will show up into your treatment facilities and ask, well, was it even real? And do I deserve to be here? And those questions I've come to understand are parts of the denial system working 
in order to really keep us safe, in order to keep us safeguarded from delving too quickly and too deeply into areas that we may not be ready for yet. And so, um, <clears throat> and if, if I could share a little bit also, my, in my own recovery, my own journey, um, this was one of my questions in, in starting out, uh, probably the first three years of me sitting on the couch, asking my therapist, well, was it real? Did it count? And intellectually, we may know that these experiences are horrific, that they are unspeakable, and there is also a drive within us to say, yeah, but. <coughs> and while these may be the questions that we um, ask in therapy, we need to remember as clinicians and as treatment providers that people will tend to ask these questions as a function of their denial. And this, like I said, is part of what helps keep them safe. And what is hard sometimes for clinicians is understanding that the client needs to deny the reality because they are not ready to grieve the losses associated with them. I used to uh, get into the material and present, and I'm going to talk a little bit more as we go along about ACEs and childhood experiences that we, that we, we have growing up. And I used to think, well, that's it. I'll, I'll show them the material. I'll let them see a visual experiential representation of it. And at the end of it, they'll get it. At the end of it, they'll get it. You're, yes. <laughs> yeah, you're smarter, wiser than I. Because what I wasn't understanding was that their being able to understand that things happen to them is not necessarily a function of them incorporating of how they happened, why they happened, what to do with those experiences. So that denial is, is there for a reason. It helps them it helps us be able to not have to go somewhere too quickly before we're ready. So this is uh, Peter Levin, um, great quote from uh, The Unspoken uh, Voice. Uh, in an unspoken voice, if trauma is to be transformed, we must learn not to confront it directly. If we make the mistake of con confronting trauma head on, then Medusa will, true to her nature, turn us to stone. It's a beautiful metaphor of Levin saying that this, this myth that goes back thousands of years lets us know about the true nature of terror and the true nature of what it is that we have to face when we look at something head on. And many times we don't have the resources to look at something head on. And so it was in the myth that, um, that the hero took uh, a shield that was polished and turned it around and Medusa saw her own reflection and herself was turned into stone. And that is a beautiful metaphor for the work that we can do, especially through experiential therapy of not having the person directly confront, but look at it through an experiential lens, through an understanding that goes and speaks not only to their intellect, but to their lived experience. Every defense mechanism and every rationalization in the client's mind will weave the story of no. No, this did not happen. No, it wasn't a big deal. No, other people had it worse. And so um, we weave the stories of no, and yet every dysfunctional system in the client's lives and every cell in their bodies will tell the story of yes. Because while someone may present in a therapeutic environment and say, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to jump in. And as well-meaning clinicians, we say, okay, the, okay, they're ready. And then we jump in thinking they're ready. And guess what? They're not ready. <laughs> they're not ready. Because many times what brings people into the therapeutic setting is that things have just gotten horrible and they've gotten so horrible that they're ready for the things to stop happening, but they're not ready to look at the reality. And so their, their stated story is no. 
while their lived experience is going to be, yes. And what we want to try and model and what we want to try and get to in experiential therapy is getting the person to their yes in as safe a manner as possible. And that's key. And so when it, um, when it comes to the, their experience, with, while the client's minds may tell them it wasn't real or a big deal, their bodies will tell a different story. And as treatment providers, as clinicians, as, as I think sometimes as artists in this work, we need to learn how to attune to that other story. So, brains. <laughs> In looking at left brain and, and right brain processing, I'm going to be speaking this morning about the, the right brain in terms of how it helps us with emotional processing, with our imagination, with nonverbal communication, our sensory input, so vo vocal tone, body language, 90% of how we communicate is through volume and tone and body language. Very, very little percentage of how we communicate is actually the words that we speak. And we can speak volumes without ever saying anything, verbally. Now, <clears throat> in this work, it can be easy to focus so much on the right brain processing, and I'm going to get into the specifics of what it means to look at the right brain in development. Sometimes we can forget that the left brain, you know, what we we look down on sometimes as, oh, you're in your head, you're analytical, you're, you're so um, crit you know, critical thinking. And I think what we fail to realize sometimes is that we will need that left brain processing in order to start to develop a cohesive narrative, a whole, in telling our stories once we make sense of the right brain experience. Remember, the left brain has, houses Broca's area, which is where language is processed and where it's developed. And so in, in, uh, in terms of narrative therapy, we absolutely must have the left brain in our processing of our stories so that we can tell a cohesive whole. And so what that is, it's, it's storytelling. And it's aha moments. It's conceptual. It's analytical. So. The therapist needs to keep in mind that we, we enter the front door through the right brain and we open the windows and let their in, the air in, in the, uh, through the left brain. Because once we're done with that processing, they will start creating their narrative cohesive story, a new story. I've always found it fascinating in working with people that when I finish working with someone, when they move or when they have had to terminate and then they think about starting with a new therapist, and you may have heard this sometimes or, or said it, oh, I have to start with a whole new therapist. I have to tell my story all over again and that's my chance to say, no, while the facts in your story may not have changed, your story is dramatically different. The telling of your story changed. And now you have a different story. The facts, nothing can change the facts. Nothing can change the history of what happened. However, your telling of the story, when you integrate healing, right brain, left brain, and when you bring that in all together, your story itself changes. And so when you go to see the new therapist, your story goes from I used to, or it goes from I am, maybe into one of I have been, or I used to, or I once was. And now we have the capability of having people tell their new story. And so we need people keyed in to both the left brain <laughs> and the right brain of accessing their storytelling story capabilities, the whole underpinnings of narrative um, therapy. And so what I'd like to do is show you a clip here of what happens, the beginning ideas of what happens when a therapist and uh, a client start 
communicating and really connecting on a deep level. This is a clip from uh, a TED Talk on uh, the topic of giving TED Talks. And um, he talks about a concept here of having ideas gel together and what happens when we, when we start gelling together. It's this. Your number one task as a speaker is to transfer into your listeners' minds an extraordinary gift, a strange and beautiful object that we call an idea. Let me show you what I mean. Here's Haley. She is about to give a TED Talk, and frankly, she's terrified. Over the course of 18 minutes, 1,200 people, many of whom have never seen each other before, are finding that their brains are starting to sync with Haley's brain and with each other. They're literally beginning to exhibit the same brainwave patterns. And I don't just mean that they're feeling the same emotions. There's something even more startling happening. And let's take a look inside Haley's brain for a moment. There are billions of interconnected neurons in an impossible tangle. But look, here, right here, a few million of them are linked to each other in a way which represents a single idea. And incredibly, this exact pattern is being recreated in real time inside the minds of everyone listening. That's right. In just a few minutes, a pattern involving millions of neurons is being teleported into 1200 minds just by people listening to a voice and watching a face. But wait. But wait, yes. <laughs> yes, and so what he's describing there is the beginnings of, of this communication style, of this communication meeting, really, of two brains in sync together, of a right brain and a right brain working in conjunction. Could I get a volunteer to kind of see what an experience like this might look like? Any brain? Yeah, OK, very good. Thank you. All right, so all right, you're good there. All right, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I'm going to ask you to move and I'm going to mirror you. No? No. Okay. That's good. How did that feel? Cool. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, now what I'd like you to do is do the same thing, and I'm going to kind of mirror you. The same exact thing? The, or, um, Something approximate. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. That yeah. wasn't taking notes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it must be exact. I, I need you to do, repeat it perfectly. Yes. Oh, that's so weird. <laughs> wow. So, say more about that. So, in the first time, there was like a flow, mm -hmm. and it felt like a. Uh, we were doing the same thing. I know that's obvious, mm -hmm. but there was just no dissonance. Right. The second time, I was doing one thing, you were doing the other thing, and this other part of my brain was going like, what the heck? Yeah. That feels awkward. Yes. And also, I felt unsure mm -hmm. about what I was doing, because you weren't doing it. Yes. But it was close-ish. Not really close-ish, but... <laughs> no, no, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But there was this other dialogue mm -hmm. that started happening which was like, why isn't this working? Right. Yeah. Oh, that's perfect. That's perfect. And so thank you so much. For, can we give her a round of applause? For you? <laughs> and so what you saw in that first example was an experience of a right brain meeting a right brain that's kinesthetics, that's sensory, that's spatial reasoning, and empathy. Yes. I felt more connected to myself the first one. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, okay. We're going deep here. <laughs> <laughs> totally oh my that. gosh. Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. And so and so and leading to the principle of when we are modeled ourselves, that's when we can truly find when we're when we're mirrored by others, that's when we can find ourselves. Alice Miller did a whole thing on on that that um, that we need to be seen in order for us to see ourselves. And so <clears throat> that's, that's all right brain stuff. And so imagine what happens when 
a therapist is able to, in the therapeutic moment, to meet and to see and to say, I see you. It, it, that's, uh, any of you who know uh, Jacob Moreno, father of psychodrama, um, he said, human beings want three things. See me, hear me, accept me. That, that's all we want. See me, hear me, accept me. And so the approximation of kind of being seen sometimes is more damaging. And I'm going to show you a, a video later um, that I'm going to apologize in advance for showing to you called the still face uh, experiment, which is horrible. Um, there'll be counseling afterwards uh, for it. But uh, it's, it's modeling uh, what it's like to not, for an infant to not be seen. And so um, what happens is when we are modeled, when we are mirrored, when we are seen, we have a chance to connect kinesthetically in our bodies with what's happening in the here and now. There was an experience where I had someone go through a group that I was facilitating and this person was, um, was known for staying in their head, uh, for speaking and speaking long about their experience. And so the person was ready, they'd gotten up to, get, uh, to do their work, their piece of work, so I tend, uh, I'll lead workshops with a, a, a blend of experiential and psychodrama work and the person was getting ready to do the work and when I started with the contract, a verbal contract of, okay, what is, what is it you'd like to, to do, immediately the person went into their left brain, went into their critical thinking and just all emotions stopped. And so I stopped the person, I said, don't tell me, show me. And at Onsite we have a cabinet with all kinds of tools and props and and toys and, and things to use experientially. And so the person went to the, the cabinet, got out the thing, grabbed the, the thing that was significant for them and immediately dropped. Dropped into their physical experience. And so this, this concept, this idea of letting people, giving people the chance to connect kinesthetically, connect emotionally, empathetically with what's happening here instead of relying on their, their cognitive process to start with is really key. And it involves opening up and giving a space, giving people a space to access that. So the question is, how do we, how do we facilitate that and how do we make that happen? Especially when people come in to our, our facilities knowing that something is wrong and not giving themselves permission to admit that something is fully wrong or something that truly did happen to them. Um, people are looking for answers and afraid that the answers they know to be true. And they will need permission to allow themselves the truth of their experiences. And sometimes the best thing that we can do is give people permission to feel the full weight and experience, to have their experiences, especially when we grow up in families where we are told that didn't happen, that wasn't real, or it may have happened, but come on, or it was so long ago. So giving people permission to have an experience, that's where the, the empathetic bond takes place. And so much of the work that I do in this, in this work is um, people say, well, that's the person that's allowed. Out of all the people that would be allowed to say they have had a real experience, they have had trauma, they say, well, that person is allowed to say they've had trauma, but not anybody else. And unfortunately, uh, what we use in, uh, across the pond, the DSM-5, use the, uh, in Europe, it's ICD-10, use something <laughs> here. Uh, the DSM-5 uh, has these criteria um, and it's very limited because when the person, we say when the person is exposed to death or threatened death, actual or threatened or serious injury or actual threatened sexual violence in these possible ways, then that would be what's considered to be post-traumatic stress disorder. And so we leave out a huge swath of people who've had childhood experiences, <laughs> maybe not rising to this level, but significant in their own right. And so these criteria show up in, in our DSM-5, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders, with 
These different criteria, so intrusive thoughts, avoiding reminders of the event, negative thoughts and feelings, and um, arousal and reactive symptoms. And at this point in the talk, typically is when I will use um, something called a logogram. And the logogram is an, a, another experiential tool. And we have a, a large room called the Oak Room where we have participants sit in for the morning lectures. And what we'll do is put out these, essentially going back to these symptoms, which are in card form. And we'll put these out all throughout the room and ask people to get up. I would ask you to do that here, but I, I don't want to cause a stampede. Um, but we ask people to physically move. And it's in the movement of sitting from the chair and then going and standing with an identified symptom that something calls out in them to say, oh, oh, because the body never lies, Alice Miller, the body never lies. And Vandercook, the, the body keeps the score. And so we trust the body to lead the person to what their truth is. And so if they're showing up with an exaggerated startle response, or if they're showing up with sleep disturbance, or if they're showing up with problems in concentrating, even the simple act of getting up from the chair and going and standing and making a claim into a symptom or something that's been bothering them, that standing up and making a claim starts the healing process because it starts the recognition that, oh, this is what my body is experiencing. As much as my mind say, may say, not a big deal, I should be over it, I you know, should have been able to handle it, your body is going to say, no, this is what you're feeling. And so at that point is when I use a locogram to ask participants, well, what can you relate with here? So. Um, while the, the post-traumatic stress disorder may not give us a full range of the, of the trauma experience, the, the research around ACEs, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Scale, does complete the picture. And so this is a snippet of Dr. Burke Harris's talk at a, a TED Med conference on, uh, on ACEs. Everybody familiar with the concept of ACEs? Yes. Yeah. And so, um, have you seen this? No. Okay, so. In the mid-90s, the CDC and Kaiser Permanente discovered an exposure that dramatically increased the risk for seven out of 10 of the leading causes of death in the United States. In high doses, it affects brain development, the immune system, hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. Folks who are exposed in very high doses have triple the lifetime risk of heart disease and lung cancer and a 20-year difference in life expectancy. And yet doctors today are not trained in routine screening or treatment. Now the exposure I'm talking about is not a pesticide or packaging chemical. It's childhood trauma. Okay. What kind of trauma am I talking about here? I'm not talking about failing a test or losing a basketball game. I am talking about threats that are so severe or pervasive that they literally get under our skin and change our physiology. Things like abuse or neglect or growing up with a parent who struggles with mental illness or substance dependence. Now, for a long time, I viewed these things in the way I was trained to view them either as a social problem, refer to social services, or as a mental health problem, refer to mental health services. And then something happened to make me rethink my entire approach. When I finished my residency, I wanted to go someplace where I felt really needed, someplace where I could make a difference. So I came to work for California Pacific Medical Center, one of the best private hospitals in Northern California. And together, we opened a clinic in Bayview Hunters Point, one of the poorest, 
most underserved neighborhoods in San Francisco. Now, prior to that point, there had been only one pediatrician in all of Bayview to serve more than 10,000 children. So we hung a shingle, and we were able to provide top quality care regardless of ability to pay. It was so cool. We targeted the typical health disparities, access to care, immunization rates, asthma hospitalization rates, and we hit all of our numbers. We felt very proud of ourselves. But then I started noticing a disturbing trend. A lot of kids were being referred to me for ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. But when I actually did a thorough history and physical, what I found was that for most of my patients, I couldn't make a diagnosis of ADHD. Most of the kids I was seeing had experienced such severe trauma that it felt like something else was going on. Somehow, I was missing something important. Now, before I did my residency, I did a master's degree in public health. And one of the things that they teach you in public health school is that if you're a doctor and you see 100 kids that all drink from the same well, and 98 of them develop diarrhea, you can go ahead and write that prescription for dose after dose after dose of antibiotics, or you can walk over and say, what the hell is in this well? So I began reading everything that I could get my hands on about how exposure to adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of children. And then one day, my colleague walked into my office and he said, Dr. Burke, have you seen this? In his hand was a copy of a research study called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. That day changed my clinical practice and ultimately my career. The Adverse Childhood Experiences Study is something that everybody needs to know about. It was done by Dr. Vince Felitti at Kaiser and Dr. Bob Onda at the CDC. And together, they asked 17,500 adults about their history of exposure to what they called Adverse Childhood Experiences, or ACEs. Those include physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, parental mental illness, substance dependence, incarceration, parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. For every yes, you would get a point on your ACE score. And then what they did was they correlated these ACE scores against health outcomes. What they found was striking. Two things. Number one, ACEs are incredibly common. 67% of the population had at least one ACE, and 12.6%, one in eight, had four or more ACEs. The second thing that they found was that there was a dose-response relationship between ACEs and health outcomes. The higher your ACE score, the worse your health outcomes. For a person with an ACE score of four or more, their relative risk of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease was two and a half times that of someone with an ACE score of zero. For hepatitis, it was also two and a half times. For depression, it was four and a half times. For suicidality, it was 12 times. A person with an ACE score of seven or more had triple the lifetime risk of lung cancer and three and a half times the risk of ischemic heart disease, the number one killer in the United States of America. And so these ACEs, for, for those who are uninitiated, especially coming through our, our programs at OnSite, who may not have heard of this concept of ACEs, um, this is news for them. So the 10 factor scale, abuse, neglect, household dysfunction. and. Like Dr. Burke Harris said, the, the higher your A score, the higher essentially everything. The higher the incidence, and I'll, I'll get the, into that in a minute, but um, especially with, uh, with, let's see, Vandercook talks about in his book, The Body Keeps the Score, that 
people with high ACE scores have 50, 50, 50 times the general population issues with lungs and breathing difficulties because trauma is stored in the lungs. And so a high ACE score is going to be indicative of these tremendously difficult, supremely challenging conditions to overcome in, in uh, adulthood. So it's tied to risk, behavior, physical and mental health issues, and I'm going to kind of breeze past these to give you an idea of just all the ways it shows up, but you'll notice that the higher the ACE score, the higher everything. The higher the ACE score, the higher the rate of adult alcoholism, of underlying chronic depression, prescriptions of antidepressants, uh, risk of perpetrating domestic violence, men and women, uh, prevalence of liver disease, uh, underlie later being raped, um, underlying suicide attempts. You'll notice again, the higher the ACE score, the higher everything. Higher the rates of chronic obstruct obstructive pulmonary disease, teen sexual behaviors, impaired work or performance. This is trauma. And so what I thought was, okay, we'll, um, we'll have people come through and I'll give them this, ed this education. I'll, I'll show them the video. I'll show them the scores. It, they can't argue with scores, right? They can't argue with, with bar graphs. I mean, bar graphs are, they're sacrosanct. You have to believe bar graphs. <laughs> I'll show them the stuff. It was, a, you know, it's a TED talk. Of, who, who can't believe a TED talk? And so they would come and learn about this, this preponderance of ACEs. And there's an experiential activity that I do uh, to kind of show what the, can I have some leeway to, to do a, a thing? Sure. You good? All right, so um, would you mind handing me that, uh, that blue bag right there? Yes, sorry, it's super heavy, okay. Now, uh, any volunteers? Yes, come on up. Hi, what's your name? Alex. Alex. Hi, nice to meet you. Okay, so these are going to represent your aces. So that's number one. That's, uh, that's number two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're thinking, why did I? Yeah. Um, and the, hold on to that. And if you could just, yeah. Okay, so Alex has one, two, three, four, so five aces. And so imagine, the, the way I do this experience at work is these are all like super big pillows. So you lucked out. <laughs> and what I have uh, the participant do, the volunteer, is to have a conversation with someone. So imagine everything that you're doing here is superimposed with huge pillows that stand between you and the person. And it, I'd let, actually put the, um, hold on to the, the backpack instead of uh, put on your, that's too easy. That's <laughs> and so this is how we show up. Yeah, so the, this is perfect. <laughs> this is how we show up in life, in our relationships. We have high A scores and whether it's uh, traumatic, you know, uh, abandonment, whether it's abuse, these experiences matter and they influence how we interact with others. So that would be one thing, right? So one adult, let's say I have my A score and your A score, and what that keeps us from is being able to truly relate to one another. I, I can kind of see you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's what we also do. We <laughs> try and push them down. Yeah, but this is not a fair assessment of what the ACEs look like. Because in reality, we don't get this as adults. These ACEs don't happen to us when we have full cognitive abilities, when we can look in our, our wallet and, and had like a horrible week at work or with mom and look in the back of our insurance card and say, oh my God, like I gotta find someone, I have to find a therapist. Or we can't call up our friends and say, oh my God, because I had the worst week. Can we go to the lake house this weekend? Can we go shopping? A five-year-old doesn't have uh, shopping friends. 
they may have play date friends, but a, a four-year-old isn't going to be able to say, you'll never believe what my mom did this weekend. <laughs> As 30 and 40 and 50-year-olds, we <laughs> say that all the time. But, but the <laughs> and so this, the, thank you, this is more of an accurate assessment of the child with all of the aces piled up trying to make it in an unsafe world without a voice. Thank you so much, Alex, for volunteering. Can we give her a round of applause? <laughs> and so fascinatingly, I used to think that doing that experiential exercise, that showing people, like actually giving them the experience and seeing what it looks like, that they'd, they'd go back to their group rooms with their group leader and then it, they'd get it. They'd say, oh yeah, I have an A score of five. So of course I would have problems in my relationships and my sleep, in how I relate to work, how I overwork or how I undereat. Of course I would. What I found, though, was happening was that they would watch the experience and they would see the bar graphs and they'd go back into their group rooms and say, yeah, but it wasn't that big a deal. And why is that? Because the disconnect is powerful and important to keep them safe. And again, it's about attuning to a new language, a new space where they can give themselves the space to admit this did happen. And my body has been telling me for years that something is wrong. I'm going to finish up here with uh, one more last snippet, hopefully this will be better, from Dr. Burke Harris about the soup in the brain. We now understand better than we ever have before how exposure to early adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of children. It affects areas like the nucleus accumbens, the pleasure and reward center of the brain that is implicated in substance dependence. It inhibits the prefrontal cortex, which is necessary for impulse control and executive function, a critical area for learning. And on MRI scans, we see measurable differences in the amygdala, the brain's fear response center. So there are real neurologic reasons why folks exposed to high doses of adversity are more likely to engage in high-risk behavior. And that's important to know. But it turns out that even if you don't engage in any high-risk behavior, you're still more likely to develop heart disease or cancer. The reason for this has to do with the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the brain's and body's stress response system that governs our fight or flight response. How does it work? Well, imagine you're walking in the forest and you see a bear. Immediately, your hypothalamus sends a signal to your pituitary, which sends a signal to your adrenal gland that says, release stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol. And so your heart starts to pound, your pupils dilate, your airways open up, and you are ready to either fight that bear or run from the bear. And that is wonderful. If you're in a forest and there's a bear, but the problem is what happens when the bear comes home every night. And this system is activated over and over and over again. And it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to maladaptive or health damaging. Children are especially sensitive to this repeated stress activation because their brains and bodies are just developing. High doses of adversity not only affect brain structure and function, they affect the developing immune system, developing hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. And so 
<clears throat> without being too super technical, I'm not a scientist or play one on TV. Um, this is the limbic system responsible for fear, survival, hunger, sex drive. Um, I'm going to talk more about this uh, after the break. Um, but this, the next system, the prefrontal cortex, ambition, self-evaluation, the ability to think about your thinking, metacognition. And so again, without being super technical, the prefrontal cortex, the super logical thinky brain, and the limbic system, the hyper-emotional feely brain. Working in conjunction to help people survive. And this is great, like Dr. Burke Harris said, it's great if you're in a forest and there's a bear, but when the HPA axis, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the adrenal cortex working together, come online over and over and over and over and over again, exposing the developing brain to a soup of cortisol, a soup, a stewing soup of constant anxiety. Then that person has upped their base level so that nothing ever feels safe. And so the therapist working with this person who's constantly at a five or six, I, I jokingly, half jokingly, not at all, my, I tell people my anxiety is always at about a, a five and a half. <laughs> okay, six, you beat it out of me. <laughs> But my um, my day to day experience, uh, I, this is what I understand. This is what I know, and so not only in my personal work, but in my work with with uh, with clients, I've had to learn how to modulate and how to regulate what's going on in me. We'll finish at the end talking about um, the 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 midbrain and how the uh, the therapist needs to be in contact with, uh, with those systems that uh, help regulate polyvagal system and, and the things that will help ground the, the therapist so that the person can be a ground for the client. But we need to understand that there is a very healthy denial system set up in place because if someone comes into a realization that there have been losses, before they're ready to grieve the losses, then more harm can be done than good. So <clears throat> what I'd like to do is we have, um, have about five minutes here. I'd, when we come back from the break, I'm gonna do one more, uh, actually that's a lie, I may do more than one more, but I'm gonna do one, another experiential uh, activity for you to get a sense of it, but I, want it, I don't wanna do it before the break. Are there any questions anybody has uh, so far about what I've talked about or, yes? Yeah, I do. So if your um, cortisol is running through your system like this, <clears throat> can you, uh, through, are you saying that through um, therapy and your mental, your mind, you can stop this? Yes, happening? yes. Does the, I, I know you're not a scientist, but does the body release something else instead of cortisol? Or? Is cortisol activated by anxiety? Yeah. Yes. So you've got to basically to stop the cortisol, you've got to stop being anxious. I yeah, so it's not about stopping being anxious, mm -hmm. it's about recognizing I am anxious right. and then deciding using some different tools in the midst of that. So I'm gonna talk about it in the next part experiential therapy is sometimes we think, oh, it's about toys and tools or, or props. Sometimes the most powerful experiential tool that we can use is uh, what Ted Klontz calls uh, exquisite listening. So truly attuning to someone else's experience and also asking someone to tie into what's happening in the here and now. And that's just as powerful an experiential process as any of the, the sculpts that we can do with props and toys. And so, um, so when someone comes into a therapy uh, engagement and they realize, okay, I'm just, I've thought about the abuse or I've thought about my mother and suddenly I'm five and I'm in that trance, I'm in, the, I'm in that moment, then what we can do is by the therapist providing, first of all, the ground of here you're safe, here you're okay to explore now we give them a chance to be able to 
um, to step back, to think about their thinking, to notice this is what's happening in my body right now. And once I notice what's happening to my body right now, now I have, I have some agency now. I have some choice. Whereas before it was a reaction or a reenactment, now I can respond. Does, does that help? Okay, yeah. Other questions? Yeah, I think that would be holistic. I think to, to the point where if, if they're ready, and so some of their life choices may be more acceptable addictions. Um, you know, as someone who's deep in alcoholism, we're not gonna reward with a new car and an expense account the way that someone working 80 hours, right? And so um, having them look at the choices that they're making and their diet and their lifestyle in the space of, okay, what is this, what, function might this be playing in your overall presentation? Because some people may be addicted to the adrenaline and addicted to, to constantly, I'm sorry, I, I have a thing. So constantly having to check and constantly being in, in contact with and never being in contact with. Is that, okay. Yes, yeah, so every participant will go come through, uh, will have that scale printed out. There are 10 questions and then they'll evaluate with their group leader how many out of the 10 they, they present with. Is that freely available? Yes, uh, yeah, it's, uh, um, it's in my bibliography and it's from uh, NPR, a national public radio, but uh, in conjunction with the um, Maybe the, the Department of Justice, but it's it'll it'll be my bibliography. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, what sort of ages do you do you kind of what sort of spectrum of age do you end up working with, and how sort of the younger people? How much does the surrounding family contribute? Who all of it? <laughs> uh, so uh, starting from age eighteen up to I think we've had uh, seventy seven. Uh, come through working in our programs and and family is a huge it's 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 huge huge component of it and we do family intensives and workshops along with uh, with group intensives um, yeah does that all right so we're going to take a 15 minute break and uh, continue on with part two thank you